morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Would you like to stand with me, please? So why don't, before we start worship, why don't we just maybe just put your hands in front of yourself, like just in receiving aspect, and then maybe just close your eyes if you're happy to do that, and maybe take a nice deep breath in, and then a nice deep breath out. So Lord, we just come before you this morning. And Lord, we want to just take this time just to quiet our hearts. Lord, we would just want to lay down our busy day, our busy week, the week coming ahead, Lord, the anxieties that we might have. Whatever the case and the situations that we come from, we just lay them down now this morning. And Lord, we want to breathe in your spirit this morning. And we want to say to you, come, Holy Spirit. Lord, just come. Lord, quiet our hearts. Lord, we come before you this morning just to to give ourselves to you. And Lord, we ask that as we, we bring ourselves to you this morning, Lord, can we worship you in spirit and in truth? So, Lord, this morning we want to honor you, we want to glorify you, we want to exalt your name. So come, Lord Jesus.
This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We'll see you break down. your name the oceans roar and tumble at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth will shout your name shout your name
Spirit, move now. The presence of the King is here. The presence of the King is here. Walls tear down. of the King is here. The presence of the King is here. Walls tear down. Spirit move now. The presence of the King presence of the King is here. The down. Spirit move now. The presence of the King is here. The presence of the King is here. of the King is here.
Giving me space to be so I'll be standing here.
Lord, we thank you. We thank you for that love like is no other, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we have such safety and security in you. We thank you that you, you are a God of love. You're a God who, who not only spoke, but you acted, Lord. You're a God who's true to his word. Thank you, Lord, that there is no other God like you. Thank you, Lord, for that you're a God of mercy. And you're a God who is good. And help us, Lord, to lean into, into that goodness, into the mercy of you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your presence. We bless who you are this morning, Lord. We bless you. We thank you. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Maria. Is Maria here? Where's Maria? I know she is here. (laughs) 
Okay, she's doing it next week. Okay, while these guys are getting ready, um, I just want to talk quickly about the Malawi mission that's happening. The guys are doing a really good job in fundraising. Just ignore the chaos up front here. You'll know what it's about just now. Um, and they, this morning, they have got pancakes, milk tarts, burvos rolls, and sweets and chips on sale. So if you do want that, please go to them at the kitchen, and they will be able to, to help you. Obviously, it's been a, a tough week for the Humboldt family, and um, for those of you who don't know, Louise Dryden um, passed away this, I think it was, was it Monday or Sunday? I can't remember now. And uh, we just want to extend our sympathies to, to the Humboldt family who've lost, obviously, a sister and an aunt in this time. And the funeral's tomorrow at harvest. So anyone who knows Louise and um, would like to go, the service is at harvest. Simone, are you ready? I'm back. Please have grace. We didn't practice this, so it is going to be all over the place. But last week Sunday, Gav obviously did a very good job of unpacking the heart of Easter camp, why we do it, why we go camp. <laughs> but if you're like me, and you know, sometimes it just goes in one ear out the other, um, I've come to visually portray what Easter camp is. So. Just bear with me for the next maybe five minutes. It will be a little bit chaotic. So just buckle your seatbelts and enjoy the show. Okay. So naturally, 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 there we go. Okay. So naturally, the first thing one does when they get up to Easter camp is they set up their tent, right? Okay. Well, we have those who who they don't love themselves, and they choose to forego the manual because they've done this a hundred times and set up their tent. And then we get the experienced campers, and they know what's best. It's easiest. Easiest is best. There we go. But don't worry. Besides watching people set up their tents, that's not the only entertainment that Easter Camp has to offer. Throughout the weekend, You'll, I'm sure you'll be finding lots of people smashing it at the volleyball nets. Smashing it at the volleyball nets. Joel smashing it at the volleyball nets. <laughs> <laughs> no factors, sorry. We're we'll smashing it at the volleyball nets. There we go. Claiming ultimate bragging rights over tug of war. Danny, tug of war. Danny, that was your slot, tug of war. <laughs> Caitlin's winning tug of war by herself. Yeah. Okay, claiming bragging rights over tug of war. Thank you, guys. <laughs> nice, Caitlin. Or testing their marriages, friendships, even sibling ships through the ultimate three-legged race. They're a little bit confused. Um, however, one thing that will leave you in awe is the annual egg toss. And let's just say for an event where there is actually no prize, some people take it very, very seriously. Okay. <laughs> Building community and fellowship is seriously one of the easiest things to do over the weekend, unless you're introverted, in which case you'll definitely get those daily steps in, finding new hiding spots every 10 minutes. From talking about the secret spices and how cooked your Mark, you on the side. <laughs> we did say it would be chaotic. So, let me just restart that. From talking about secret spices and how cooked your meat is over at the Bry Fires. Okay, those are for sale after church, by the way. Um, to chatting to other parents while the kids slip and slide. Raymond? Okay, well... They're supposed to be slip and sliding. Yeah, from here. Slip and slide. Slip and slide. Mark, just pull him, please. So 
someone put <laughs> the bikes are coming early. <laughs> Slip and slide. <laughs> or getting tackled on the jumping castle. <laughs> there we go. Or getting tackled on the jumping castle. Let's all admit it. The biggest catch up always happens at the annual over 30s and under 30s cricket match where the men rough it out, while us ladies and other spectators, of course, chat and snack away. Now, you'll probably have seen that there's a fair share of competitive spirit at Easter camp, from which site has the best coffee, <coughs> wine, and setup. in which case, if you are wanting to keep both elbows and ankles intact, watch out for these. Margie will tell you the story. Okay. To which kid is the fastest in the land? That's your cue. To which kid is the <laughs> to which kid is the fastest in the land with the bike ride big bike ride races? Wow. Here we go. <laughs> bike races. And of course, the age old rival between the old people, <clears throat> I mean the over thirties and the under 30s. Gavin, that was your, there we, yeah, yeah, that was your one. There we go. Okay. There are some things that one needs to spiritually prepare oneself for, especially for those who get stuck to snorers and sleep talkers. <laughs> Baptisms are also a highlight as we celebrate the journeys our family have walked. And of course, it wouldn't be Easter camp without Dave's signature dance moves, portrayed by Gavin as in Dave's absence. <laughs> Thank you, Gavin. Okay. By now, I hope you can see that we pride ourselves in making Easter camp a place where everyone can partake and enjoy, no matter which age and stage of life. From kids' sessions during the day to our annual Easter egg hunt, the egg hunt. They are very. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> to karaoke for our wilder crowd at night. But that's you. You. Never mind. Okay. But one piece of advice that I can give you, besides advising that you totally have to come to camp, is that those shower hours need to be planned to a T. Okay? <laughs> to a T. Otherwise, you get no warm water. Okay. So have we all survived the show? Gas showers. Okay. There we go. Who's amped for camp? Who is going to sign up now immediately using the QR code, which should come up behind me, if you haven't done already? There it is. Anyone signing up now before they forget again? No one. Okay, you've all signed up. My job's done then. Thank you. Well done, Simone. So Easter camp's going to be amazing. And we didn't even say we're ending our Easter camp celebration, obviously, at the 40 years of having an amazing Spitfire at 6 o'clock on Sunday. Isn't that a cool? Yeah. Eh? That's going to be a great family celebration, and it's going to be amazing. Awesome. So can we have the notices, please? We would like to welcome all of our visitors and would love to bless you with a free cappuccino. Please meet one of our hospitality team members at the coffee shop after the service. Join us for the evening service on Sunday the 24th of March at 6.30 p.m. as we celebrate a Passover meal and look back at two defining images that solidify the grounds of our understanding of Jesus. Our annual Easter camp will take place from the 28th of March to the 1st of April at the Kirkwood High School. Come and celebrate 40 years of Fountain with us. The weekend will be filled with fun, friendship, and community. 
as well as life-changing times in the presence of God. If you would like to get more information, please see the flyer or contact the church office. To sign up, complete the form provided through the QR code, Google form link, or on the response card. Food and Fellowship. Join the men's breakfast on Saturday the 6th of April at 7.30 a.m. to 10 o'clock a.m. If you have a scottle, please bring it and share with others. Bring ingredients and make your own breakfast. All men are welcome. The Resource Center, Fountain Vineyard's very own library, will be open every Sunday after the morning service as well as during church office hours. Just a reminder that all information on events, information about the church, contact details, bank details, etc. can be found on the notice board at the main entrance or on our website. I just want to highlight something on the Passover meal. So what we've decided to do is Mark's going to lead us through what um, the Passover meal is and he will have a display table with all the correct food. But to make life simpler for everyone else, we're saying anyone who wants to join us, just bring a picnic um, meal with you. And obviously, we'll eat together and share together. And Mark will use the display table and take us through all the candles and the different prayers, et cetera, et cetera. And then also, we don't have to wait for RSVPs and to try to cater a specific way. So we're trying to keep it quite simple. But we encourage you, anyone is welcome, please come and join us next week, next Sunday. It's going to be a really, really good time. And we're excited to, to go through that Passover meal, and Mark will, will lead us through it. So please come and join us. That would be amazing. All right, the offering this morning will go towards the general ministry and the children's shirts their children may leave. And those doing the offering, if you could come. Oh, yes. One more thing about Easter camp. For those people that are not able to attend Easter camp or whatever, or if you're coming to Easter camp and you have extra tents and stuff, we are desperately in need of, of tents and mattresses. So if you can help us in any way, please contact the church office or contact Margie um, that we can help some of those that, that don't have tents or perhaps have never camped before. So if you can assist, that'll be great. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this time of just community and time together. And Lord, as, as a community, we want to bring our seeds to you now and our offering and, our, and our, yeah, just our money and our physical part of, of who we are, Lord. And we ask that you would take it, you would bless it. Lord, I pray that you would extend your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dale, just for anyone who's interested, Dave Grew is preaching this evening, and we on episode eight of um, The Chosen, which should be, be quite cool, and we have Dale with us this morning. So let's just uh, reach out your hands, let's pray for Dale. Lord, we thank you for Dale, I thank you for for what you're doing in his heart and life, Lord. And I, I thank you for this time spent with you and this word that he's going to bring, Lord. And I ask, Lord, that you would give him peace. And Lord, that as he shares, Lord, may the passion that you've put inside of him come out. And may the words that he shares speak deeply into our hearts and lives this morning, Lord. So, so bless him, we ask, as he shares. In Jesus' name, amen. No. Yes, I'm getting a th thumbs up now. Okay. I'm on, but the mic isn't. <laughs> right. A bit of a rocky start, but um, 
I'm just going to pray again, if you don't mind. Father, I just commit this word to you now, Lord. It's been a hard word to prepare and an even harder word to share, Lord. But I just pray that your word would fall on fertile hearts this morning, Lord. I just pray that whatever is not of you would be blown away. But whatever is of you, Lord, I just pray would find fertile ground and that you in your goodness and in your spirit would water it and bring it to fruition now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I feel like I'm stepping into a confessional every time I stand up here because I always land up confessing something. Um, and this time it just seems to be the, the trials of life. Um, I don't know about you, but the last 12 to 18 months have been particularly difficult for me. Um, you know, I know I'm not alone in this because just within our family and within our circle of friends and within our colleagues, there have been four deaths three strokes and a heart attack in the last few months. So it's been a, it's been a rough ride for a lot of people. Um, and it just seems like 2023 is the gift that just keeps on giving. Um, so this year marks 30 years of me walking with the Lord and 27 of them with my wife. And I don't think in all that time we've had a more difficult season in terms of our family, in terms of our personal walk. Um, and, you know, looking back, it just seems that everything was thrown at us, including the kitchen sink. Or maybe not the kitchen sink, but definitely the gate motor and the geezer and a whole bunch of other things. But financially, emotionally, physically, nothing seems to have been spared. And I, I can't speak for my wife, but I know that the last six months or so have been the most difficult that I've ever faced or walked through um, as a Christian. And my year started on the 1st of January with reading the entire book of Job. So I'll just leave that there. I think that it says enough. Um, you know, having said that, in the, in the better moments, the, the last few months have been the sweetest I've ever experienced as a Christian. Um, I don't think, apart from being saved in those first few months after being saved, that I've ever felt so close or so intimate with Jesus as I have over these last few months. Um, you know, my journal's full of reflections of how in those moments the sweetness of the presence of God has been with me. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I've, like Jacob, wrestled with the Lord, and I've been left with a permanent limp over this last while. And my prayer this morning is that you would leave here with a limp as well. So what I share with you this morning as I prayed is particularly difficult, but it's me sharing with you and not preaching at you. Um, it's just what I've walked through and what I've learned over the last while. So I just pray that you'd bear with me um, as we embark on a challenging time. So my question is, is that what should our walk with Jesus be like? You know, should it be joyful? Should it be difficult? Should it be challenging? Should it be satisfying? And I think the answer to all of that is yes, it should be. But I think that there's a better word for that, and that it's our walk with Jesus should be simple. And if you're looking for a title for the sermon this morning, it's, it's simply this, the simplicity of following Jesus. So, if you can relate at all to my story about the last few months, to the trials and the triumphs, to the, the bitterness and the sweetness, then I think you'll agree that that sounds like anything but simple. But just bear with me as we unpack it. So, I think in our postmodern society of comfort and the search for convenience, 
of celebrating the great me. I think that we've lost the simple call of Jesus to just follow me. You know, Jesus was pretty emphatic about that call. It wasn't follow me if you feel like it, or follow me if things are going well, or follow me if you are financially stable or emotionally well. He just called us to simply follow me with everything. And, you know, if we consider the verses like Matthew 10, 37 to 39, it says, anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. See, the simplicity of following Jesus is this. He simply wants everything, all of you. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. These are the verses we don't want to hear. We try and gloss over them. We try and skim over them. We try and read into them a meaning that's not there. But the harsh reality and simplicity of them is that for us to follow Jesus, we've got to give him everything. I think that we struggle so much in our life because we try and cling to what is not really ours. We try desperately to cling to our lives. And this clinging to things just brings us more anguish. Perhaps a life and soul completely surrendered to Jesus and a life sacrificed on his cross would bring us more peace. When our striving to save the eye ceases and we instead live for him, we will find peace. Um, I believe that the reality of these words are important and that they're relevant for the church. My wife and I, along with a, f a few other people, you know, have felt that there's a threshing coming you know, um, to the church, that, that there's going to come a time, and maybe it's now, I've certainly felt it, where there's going to be a separation between the wheat and the chaff, where there's going to be a divide between those who consider themselves Christians in word and mind and the disciple who's following Jesus with everything, who's laying down his life. Billy Graham, in his book, Peace with God, wrote this in 1953. There will be a falling away from true faith. Many have a false idea of God and see a caricature of Christianity. They are not truly, they are not really true disciples of Jesus Christ. They have already unwittingly fallen away, but maybe not intellectually. They may still believe, but they're falling away in the way they live. Your life justifies what you believe. Jesus says, by their fruits you shall know them. There's a poem by an unknown author that goes like this. Only one life will soon be past, and only what's done for Christ will last. This truth is hard to hear, but it's so necessary for a fruitful and a peaceful life. And I say this with caution, because saying this from the pulpit tends to offend, but I speak to myself more than anyone else. So Jesus stands before his church this morning and the invitation is clear. Follow me with everything. Follow me in spirit and in truth with your whole life. Follow me and lay down your life and I will give you mine. Then the trials and tribulations you face will be but a shadow in the light of me.
uh, to have the confidence with Paul when he says in Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So following Jesus is not easy, but it's simple. Just die. So we're going to look at three aspects of following Jesus this morning. The call to follow Jesus, the cost of following Jesus, and the comfort that comes from following Jesus. So Jesus calls. He called his disciples when he walked 2,000 years ago, and he calls us today. The question is, why should we answer him? The first reason is quite simply because we were made to follow him. We were made to be in a relationship with God. And Jesus, through his death, through his sacrifice, through his life, through his resurrection, is the only way to get there. In his book, Every Disciple's Journey, Thomas Degolt writes this, and he's quoting Augustine. God has made us for himself. And our hearts find no rest till they rest in him. There is this God-shaped hole in each of us. And as we and as we try to fill it with other lesser things, we are never at peace until that hole is filled with God. John Piper says it like this: no thing can satisfy the soul. The soul was made to stand in awe of a person, the only person worthy of awe. God created us to live with a single, all-embracing, all-transforming passion, namely a passion to glorify God. So we were made for God, and in his great mercy and love, he gave us his only begotten son, who suffered and died in our place to ensure that the God-shaped hole in our heart is filled for eternity. The second reason we follow is because of who is calling us. We are not called to follow by an inanimate, uncompassionate God. We are called by a God who lived a human life, who suffered and died in our place for the death that we deserved, and who is now risen after conquering death, and who sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us. You see, Jesus is magnificent. He is the embodiment of the Father, the incarnation of his very fullness, who laid down his life for us in a brutal death on the cross, who became our sin and shame so that he could purchase and ransom us for God, who rose to new life so we could escape the sting of death and live with him for eternity. And as we move towards Easter and Holy Week, this message is even more important. So in humility, he walked this earth and in glory, he'll return to claim his bride The Apostle John writes in the fifth book of Revelation, he says this, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature who is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. This is who is calling you to follow him. Because of his love, because of his suffering, because of his obedience unto death, because he is the lamb who was slain, because he lost his life so that we could find it, we answer the call with our lives. 
So how does Jesus call us? Now the harsh, harsh passage in Matthew 10 and Luke 14 comes after Jesus has revealed himself. It comes after he's walked with his disciples. It comes after he has healed and saved and made the blind see and the lame walk. It's after he has shown us who he is and what he is. I look back at my own walk these past few months and before things got really tough, I wrote this in my journal. I feel like the Lord is wooing me into a deeper relationship with him. I feel like he is courting me to be his bride. Like he is inviting me into a deeper, more loving relationship with him. So Jesus calls us, whether it's to salvation or to a deeper commitment, by first revealing who he is. By courting us with his love, by wooing us with his mercy, and inviting us into a deeper relationship with him. Thomas Stegold sums it up beautifully when he says, God loves, Jesus calls, disciples follow. So Jesus calls <clears throat> this morning. He calls us to himself. And if you're here this morning and you don't know him, he's calling you. He calls us to deeper things, to a new chapter, a more dedicated life, a deeper commitment. So the question this morning is, what is Jesus calling you to? And will you follow? And if you will, then there will be a cost. See, nothing... <coughs> Nothing in this life or the next is of any value if it's attained cheaply or easily. <clears throat> there is a cost to following Jesus, and that cost will exact a heavy toll. Now, in today's culture, that's not a popular truth. In fact, there's some gospels that, are, that will proclaim that following Jesus results in gain. Pro gain in your prosperity, a healthier life, an easy life, a life free from heartache and hardship. This cheap grace examined in the light of Jesus' words holds little weight and even less long-term growth or maturity in Christ. Following Jesus will cost you as a Christian, we should be poorer. We should be poorer financially. We should be poorer emotionally. We should be poorer from our time. And Jesus is pretty emphatic <coughs> in describing this cost. In the <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> in Luke 14... And it goes like this. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish or what king, going to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with, with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus here is elaborating <clears throat> on what it means to be a disciple. In fact, the title of the scripture in your Bible is entitled The Cost of Discipleship. So he outlines some imp important points. 
Firstly, <clears throat> you need to bear your own cross. So this is not a metaphor for some hardships that you may encounter along the way. Most commentators agree that this refers to exactly what it sounds like, death. An excruciating, painful, and comfortable death. But death comes in many forms. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his famous book, The Cost of Discipleship, says this, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ's suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. It is that dying of the old man which is the result of his encounter with Christ. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give our lives over to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but it meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. So the first one was you need to bear your own cross. The second one is you need to count the cost of your commitment. Like the builder and the king, there needs to be a calculation and a decision about whether you want to follow or not. First, first sit down and count the cost. The question might arise, how do I know what that cost will be? And the answer simply is you don't. Jesus asks you to make the commitment fully and completely in advance, regardless of what comes. There's no negotiating, it's simply all or nothing. Um, I felt a call about three and a half years ago to a radical change in my life. And in my exuberance, I answered it. And part of the, the struggles over the past few months have been uh, the reality of what that call is. Um, and it culminated in, a, in me languishing before the Lord, wrestling with him like Jacob did. And the limp that I was left with was simply this, that I came to the point of saying, whatever it takes, Lord, whatever it is, I'm yours and you are mine. So the first was you need to bear your cross. The second was you need to count the cost. And the third is you need to sacrifice all you have. Again, Bonhoeffer shed, shed some light on this. He says, the only man who has the right to say that he is justified by grace alone is the man who has left all to follow Christ. We are called quite simply to be willing to renounce all that we have for the sake of following Jesus. Death and cost paying are constituent parts of following him. Your life is no longer your own. Your dreams are no longer your own. Your emotions are no longer your own. We are to say with Paul in 1 Corinthians six nineteen that I am not my own, for I was bought with a price. So to understand the cost we need to pay, we need to look at the cost that Jesus paid. Christ paid a price for us. He took up his cross and ransomed us with his very life. He counted his cost and deemed us worthy of the sacrifice. He renounced all he had, his relationship with Abba Father, so that we could be made sons of God. See, the cost is relative to the reward. Our cost of following Christ should be seen in the light of the incredible reward he has obtained for us, most importantly, union with the Father. To be able to stand before the God of the cosmos 
to be able to stand before God one day completely clean, completely blameless and accepted before him because of what Christ has done, because of the cost that he has paid. The cost of our lives in light of this should just pale in comparison. C.S. Lewis's words in Mere Christianity ring true. He says, give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and favorite wishes every day and the death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back nothing. Nothing that you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look to Christ and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Paul writes in Romans, for none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. So what does your walk with Jesus cost you? What will it cost you? If the words are Jesus, if the words of Jesus are true, the answer is everything. You've been bought with a price. Is anyone limping yet? <clears throat> but there is a comfort and a peace that comes when we've paid the cost. In their book, The Fellowship of the Suffering, Paul Borthwick and David Ripper write the following. They say, suffering finds us all, every last one of us. Its forms are as varied, numerous, and unique as the very people on earth who experience its consequences. There is no getting around the reality that to be alive is to experience suffering. To follow Jesus is to endure hardship. It doesn't matter what our role or vocational calling is, or even how outwardly successful we might be. The same thing is true for everyone who follows Christ. Suffering comes with the territory. As I mentioned earlier, the last while has been incredibly difficult for me and for our family. But there's been a closeness for me with Jesus that has been so sweet. You know, and to the world, this just sounds comical. But Jesus says in John 14, 27, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. See, Jesus doesn't promise us a kind of peace, a worldly peace. No, he promises to give us his peace. It is completely different from the world's. The world says you can find peace when all of your circumstances are aligned, when your financials, finances are, are stable, when you're emotionally healthy, when your family is intact. But Jesus promises a heavenly peace despite the trouble and the suffering that we face in this world. Even more than that, he promises us his peace, the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding. So suffering finds us all, but so does the heavenly peace that Jesus gives. So the question is, how do we find this comfort? How do we endure the trials and tribulations that face all of us in this world? I think in two ways. 
The first is by the great exchange. So Martin Luther used this term to describe the exchange on the cross, the propitiation that Jesus paid for our sins. So our sin for his righteousness. I think it goes further than that. I think that on that cross and in that exchange, I think Jesus gave us all he was so that we could enjoy everything he gave. So his spotless, sinless life for our sinful, depraved life, his separation from the Father for our union with him, his peace and joy and suffering for our anxious and worried heart. <clears throat> the great exchange was not just about our sin for his eternal life. but about our despair for his joy, our hopelessness for his hope eternal, our anxiety for his peace. So quite simply, all of us for all of him. So we are to cast our worries onto him, lay our anxieties, our trials, our tribulations at the foot of the cross. And we are to walk away from the cross carrying his peace and his joy The second is our eternal reward. You know, we become disheartened when we look at the, the suffering and the trials and the tribulations that we face in light of this life only. You know, this life is not a mere throwaway. It's not a way to pass the time until Jesus comes back. This life and all of its hardships are for eternal value. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary afflictions are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are unseen are eternal. God uses what we experience in this life for eternity. He molds us, he shapes us, so that our character will be what we take into eternity. In fact, the primary way that God shapes us is by the trials that we face. Dallas Willard gives us a very sober reminder. He says, the only thing that you and I will get out of our lives one day when we die and stand before God, when everything else is stripped away and who we really are is made known, is the person we will have become. So comfort in Christ comes from understanding that in Jesus, in his death on the cross, we have access to everything he was and is. We have access to his peace, to his comfort, to his joy. And we have comfort knowing that this life is temporary. It is the seen that there is an eternal glory in the age to come that is unseen if we suffer well. Jesus leaves us with a promise in John 16, 33. He says, these things I have spoken to you. Thank you, Sarah. That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So Jesus says, in me you will find peace. In comfort. In me, your suffering in this world will seem light and but for a moment. In me, your trials and your tribulations will work for you an eternal weight of glory. So, have you found the peace that surpasses all understanding? Have you befriended the Prince of Peace who gives his heavenly peace to all who ask? 
Or are you still looking to the things of this world to bring you comfort? Jesus stands at the door and knocks this morning. Will you answer? Will you accept the cost to follow him? Will you lose yourself in him so that his comfort will bring you a peace that surpasses understanding? These are the questions we must all ask ourselves. They're not irrelevant. They cannot be ignored. They are questions for eternity and only on the other side of your answer will you find joy in the joy of knowing Christ. So before we close with the prayer, I'd like to quote John Piper. He says, The path of God-exalting joy will cost you your life. Jesus said, Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will find it. In other, word, in other words, it's better to lose your life than to waste it. If you live gladly to make others glad in God, your life will be hard, your risks will be high, and your joy will be full. So if I can just ask the worship team just to come up. We're going to close with a prayer. It's... Um, I'm led to believe that it's a prayer prayed in the Methodist churches at the beginning of every year. It's called the Covenant Prayer by John Wesley. And I'm going to ask you all to pray, or to pray, to stand as we pray. But I'd encourage you to take it seriously and not to pray it if you don't feel led because God has a sense of humor when it comes to us asking him for things. So it's a hard prayer, but it's a necessary one. And there are copies of it up here, if you'd like one at the end of the service. But we're going to pray it, and I'm gonna, we're going to make time for the Holy Spirit to come and to do whatever he wants to do. So it goes like this, and the words should come up. I'm no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you. Praised for you or criticized for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and your service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine and I am yours, so be it. In the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen. So I just felt that there were a few kinds of people, a few groups of people that like to pray for this morning. The most important are those who don't know Jesus. And maybe you're here this morning and you feel that he is calling you. Don't be afraid of the cost. The reward is so much greater. So if you're here this morning and you don't know him, you're here because he's called you. And I'd love the privilege of being able to pray for you. The second are those that might be feeling that, that God is calling you to a new season to a deeper commitment. Maybe you need encouragement. Maybe you need someone just to stand with you and just to pray for God's peace.
And the second group of people are those who might be walking with the cost of following Jesus. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe your business has failed. Maybe your children are not walking with the Lord, but God says that on the other side of the cost, there is a comfort and a peace. And maybe you just need someone this morning just to stand with you and put an arm around you and just pray for the peace that surpasses understanding. The peace that comes from the Prince of Peace just to fill you. So just as we close in, in worship, the altar at the front is open. Maybe you just want to take a copy of this prayer and just kneel before God and just say, Lord, I just commit myself to you afresh this morning. And whatever that in entails, but just come. There are plenty of people here who are willing to pray with you, to stand with you, to sit with you, to cry with you. Consuming fire fan into flame, a passion for your name, Spirit of God, would you fall in this place, Lord?
I invite your presence, Lord. Thank you that you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That you're the great I am. That you're all powerful, Lord, and that you also come in your gentleness. So we just receive you this morning, Lord. this morning church that I felt might be relevant <clears throat> and that is we always always have hope in Jesus that in the suffering and the pain and the questions and the confusion there's always hope and so I felt for those who feel that they need the hope of the Lord this morning I encourage you guys to come forward and be prayed for. And then sometimes counting the cost is just simply about responding to the Lord in obedience. And last week I put out a call for those who want to be partnering with Jesus more. you church but sometimes we Andrew my back okay. it's all good but we like hanging on to us our own comforts and it's not easy to take the time out to speak to someone in the shops and share the gospel with them or to pray for the sick or to heal the blind or the crippled or to pray for someone. So there are people up front who need prayer. So sometimes counting the cost is getting out of your chair and coming to pray for people. So I just encourage you, church, to respond to Jesus as you feel he's leading you this morning. And to be willing to count the cost. And let go of self. And be obedient to the Lord. doing the stuff that Jesus did and you want prayer for that to be full to the Holy Spirit I invite you up otherwise come pray for those who need prayer Speed. 